just it was really weird for me like I didn't I didn't know how to exude confidence or like like imposter syndrome is something that is always there for me like I it's more of learning how to suppress those thoughts and how can aspiring PMs stand out in the interview first of all context for those who are interviewing realize that your interviewer probably was in back-to-back -back meetings right before the 30-minute interview and so their mind is likely elsewhere when they first come into that interview. The worst thing you can do is to pretend you know something or like mm -hmm. make it up. Do not do that. Let me find out and I'll get back to you on that. That's like a, a phrase people use a lot in the corporate world to signal that like, I don't know, but I don't want to say I don't know, but everyone knows what it means. <laughs> yeah. It was only 10 minutes of my life, but it still haunts me to this day. It probably <laughs> felt like two hours to no. have, like the yeah. longest meeting. Yeah. Welcome to Cherie's Corner, a podcast where we dive into the topic of careers and hear from my friends and guests who are killing it in the business world so we can learn from their wisdoms, their lessons, and their mistakes. I'm your host, Cherie. I'm currently a business school student at Stanford University, and previously I've held roles in tech and venture capital. In this podcast episode, I interview my former colleague, Emily Tang. Emily is a senior product manager at LinkedIn, where she leads cross-functional teams of designers and engineers on LinkedIn's learning edtech platform. She and I worked on the same team for three years, and I am so excited to have her on this show. We both started out in LinkedIn's associate product manager program. Emily gives tips for those wanting to break into product management, talks about dealing with imposter syndrome in the workplace, and shares her story of presenting in incredibly high pressure situations to LinkedIn's CEO. Let's jump in. Hi, Emily. Welcome to Cherie's Corner Podcast. Thank you for having me. You can introduce yourself, where you grew up, how you grew up. Emily, I, I was born and raised in Taipei, Taiwan. So yeah, majority of my life spent there. Only came to the States for college. And I went to Stanford, studied computer science and psychology. My parents grew up in a generation where men were supposed to study engineering, Women studied humanities, exactly what my mom and dad did. Like mm. my mom was in humanities, my dad was an electrical engineer. And so growing up, I was constantly told that like, hey, you might not be that good at math because I'm not good at math. At least that's what my mom would say to me. And mm. like, I distinctly remember like high school, freshman year, I was in geometry with proof as many of us were. And uh, after a month or so, my mom like went to my math teacher and asked like, hey, I don't know if Emily is ready for this class. And my math teacher, thankfully, like believed in me and was like, hey, no, Emily is totally fine. Like she's doing well and everything was fine. But I think that's just the undercurrent of how you know, I grew up. And so getting a major in computer science was not easy because I just constantly felt this imposter syndrome of like, hey, do I really belong here? Like, can I do this? You know, are women not as good at math, like these are mm -hmm. things that I've like had to overcome yeah. throughout, um, yeah, this journey. Yeah, no, that's tough. I think growing up, like internalizing a lot of that, mm -hmm. when we don't even realize it just feels like a conversation here and there. But then I think over time, like whether it's a conversation with family or even like other classmates, it's hard to believe in yourself when like you've been having this like very fixed thought for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's something that you've overcome or is it still something that like kind of like sits in the back of your brain? I feel like imposter syndrome is something that is always there for me. Like I, it's more of learning how to suppress those thoughts and like <laughs> just believe in yourself. And it has been helpful, like having like amazing peers and, and managers like telling me like, hey, Emily, you know, you're doing a great job. Like, like believe in yourself, be more confident, like trust your gut. And so those are things that I try to remember when I have thoughts like, oh, do I really belong here? Like, what am I doing here? And that's, that's helped me a lot. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about your career path after you graduated from Stanford? When I was in college, I had no idea what I was going, what I wanted to do. And I... Which is pretty common. Yeah. Went to college day one. I thought I was going to be a doctor. So I was pre-med for a day, dropped it because I really didn't want to take any more chemistry. <laughs> And then I, you know, spent two summers doing research because I thought 
I would get a PhD and follow the footsteps of my my brother and my dad. Um, and then I realized research was too slow for me. And so I went into the industry where I tried being a back-end engineer. Didn't like it because I couldn't see anything that I was building. And then moved to front end for a summer. Hated it because there was one moment when my designer came over and was like, Emily, can you move that like two pixels to the right? Do you do that like, now? Do you do that now? <laughs> Um, no, I try not to. I try not to. You know, through those experiences, I was like, okay, I'm not happy with these roles that I'm trying out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, thankfully, I did have a few friends who, you know, told me, hey, like, have you tried product management? Like, I think you would be really good at this. And were they older friends or? They were actually in my year. Okay. I think they were just, they had been in the, or they had done summer internships in tech, like, more summers than I had. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I had one friend who did try out a product internship and was like, hey, Emily, I think you'd be good at this. Like, mm -hmm. have you considered this? And to be honest, I, I hadn't considered it because it was just not not a career path I was familiar with. Um, but thankfully, I, you know, had a few summers because I had extended my schooling to stay in school forever <laughs> um, and while I was doing my master's. And so I got the opportunity to try being an APM intern mm -hmm. at LinkedIn and I... And I liked it more than my other roles. So I thought, hey, this might be something I could do full time. It sounds like there was a lot of experimentation. Yeah, like for through sure. internships, figuring figuring out what you like and what you don't like. How do you know what you like and what you don't like? Is there some reflection that has to be done, some journaling? Like what does that look like for you? It's important to reflect at the, you know, end of each summer and sort of think through, hey, what really motivated me or like what what did I enjoy and what what did I hate? And I honestly, I think like with every job, there are things that are great and things that are not so great. And so it's sort of picking something that hopefully most of the time you are energized mm -hmm. and like sometimes you might not be so, but reflecting and trying to, you know, find something where I didn't feel like I was going to wither away. <laughs> <laughs> not withering away is yes. important. True. Yeah. You and I first started out together. We met because of LinkedIn's APM program. You've had this really successful career as you, you know, worked at LinkedIn for the past like five years. Yeah, it's been five years. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about your start at LinkedIn? Maybe some of the lessons that you learned like early on in your early 20s about career? What's really unique about being an APM, which I'm sure you relate to, is like you get thrown in to this new role where suddenly you have to make the call and like make these decisions. And I remember my first team, I was on the onboarding team and my engine manager at the time was much older than me. Actually, like most people around me were, you know, 10, 20 years older. And so I felt really uncomfortable. It just, it was really weird for me. Like I didn't, I didn't know how to exude confidence or like think that, okay, I, I know what I'm doing because I really didn't know what I was doing. And so I think one of the first lessons that I learned was like, it's okay to not know everything. And I think that for me was was huge because I had gone through most of my life, like knowing how to prepare for exams, like knowing things and and being like on top of everything. And I realized it was okay if like a leader asked me, hey, Emily, what's this? To say like, hey, I don't know. I will get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that was lesson number one. I think lesson number two is a little... It almost contradicts lesson number one, but lesson number two is that you need to realize that you are the expert in the role that you're taking. So for me, when I was an APM that first year and I was leading the onboarding team, um, I remember Liz telling me like, hey, like you are the expert on onboarding now. Mm -hmm. And so believe in yourself and realize that you know the ins and outs of the flow, you know, like the data, you're the one looking at these dashboards every day and so you are the expert in this. And I should really believe in myself and know that, hey, I, I am the expert on this and I should have the confidence mm. in that too. Totally. So. The first point really rings true that you don't have to know everything. Mm -hmm. You're not expected to know everything. Otherwise, there would be no more learning to do on the job and your bosses don't expect you to know everything. It takes a certain level of like self-confidence to say, I don't know. And I think for like type A, high achievers, people who like plan a lot, it's just like gut-wrenching. Be like, 
am I supposed to know? Like I am the, I am the expert here. Like, is this something that I should be able to answer? But it's also a level of maturity to be like, I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that, which if you don't know the answer, do not make something up. <laughs> right? Like yeah. The worst thing you can do is to pretend you know something or like mm-hmm. make it up. Do not do that. Yeah. But what you can say is let me find out and I'll get back to you on that. That's like a, a phrase people use a lot in the corporate world to signal that like, I don't know, but I don't want to say I don't know, but everyone knows what it means. Yeah. Yeah. For people who are interested in product management, is there some advice that you would give to them? To be curious. I think that's like a really important thing in everything you do really. But uh, for example, one of the things I, I would strongly encourage is like, hey, when you are using that app, when you're you know scrolling through Reddit or like whatever app you're using, like think about if I... If I were the PM there or if I, you know, were the CEO there, like, what would I do? What would I change? And what are the things that you would improve and exercising that muscle of, of being curious on about the things you're using every day mm-hmm. will just help you build the skills you need to, you know, succeed as a product manager. It's like kind of how you start thinking like a product manager. Mm-hmm. If you're not a product manager, yeah. you're just like, damn, like, I'm so frustrated that like, this app is not working the way it's supposed to either there's a bug or like it just doesn't make sense and then as like a pm you put that hat on you're like how would i change it to make it better Mm -hmm. or the flip side is like if you notice something you really enjoy or was like delightful and just taking note of it and thinking like what what was good about that Mm -hmm. or like why did they make these decisions once you get to the interview process Mm -hmm. like that type of thinking of like What is the flow? What would you improve about it is exactly what is tested. Emily, could you talk about a time in the workplace where you felt like you learned and grew the most from a project? Yeah, so recently, a few months ago, I had this really cool opportunity uh, to present my project and what I've been working on for the past year to our CEO and our C-suite. They have this weekly meeting on Tuesdays where they review the business and like just things that are going on. I started preparing about two weeks before the presentation, uh, putting together slides, working with a team to figure out, okay, what is it that we wanted to say to our senior leaders? And I had finalized the slides. I had done run-throughs with my manager and our skip levels. And, you know, everyone was like, hey, we're good to go. Like, let's roll. And then I had sent the slides to our VP, Hari, on Friday. And Friday at 5.30 p.m., he messages me, Emily, like the slides are not ready. Like I was panicking. Mm. And he, you know, he calls me up and he's like, hey, there, there's too much content in this. Like what happened? And I spent the entire weekend redoing the slides, um, trying to chop it down to really like three slides that we really want to communicate. Disaster number one averted, you know? Mm. And then- How did the meeting go? Yeah, so Tuesday morning, I go into the office. We had prepared, you know, 10 pages of Q&A, potential Q&A, that we thought we'd get asked and uh, even to the point of like, who's going to take what question. And of course, none of the questions I prepared for were asked during the meeting and stumbled my way through some answers and, you know, that could have been more concise. And uh, I think overall that it was only 10 minutes of my life, but it still haunts me to this day. It probably felt like two hours to like the longest meeting. Yeah, yeah. What are the the things that you learned from going through that experience? The first learning I had was like, there can be such thing as too much input. So I was preparing the slides and essentially for the two weeks I had talked to my manager, I had shared it with our content lead and, and asked for input on like, hey, what else would you include? And that sort of exploded. And there were too many slides and too much content at the end. And so that's because you're a really inclusive leader. <laughs> you know, I know you're, there's probably too much, but that's you're good at including people. The second thing is like, there can be such thing as being overprepared, being okay with, again, things not going according to plan because I am very type A. But, you know, I had 10 pages of questions and right. just being able to take that and be like, all right, like I can do this and uh, answer any question that, that Still in my way, basically. Yeah. I'm like sweating listening to you. <laughs> it brings me back, and I don't think I want to be back in that position. <laughs> it was like, very stressful. You're sweating. Yeah, I I literally couldn't sleep for multiple nights just leading oh up to this meeting. And I 
I, know. I really hope no one in product exec watches this because they're they're probably laughing like, oh, it's 10 minutes. Like, no. why was she freaking out? Like, oh, I understand. Maybe like other people won't understand. But to me, I'm like getting, I think my heart rate is like, <laughs> racing just thinking about that. Like it would feel like two hours when you're like put on the spot, you're presenting to executives. But I think it also goes to show though that like how much trust that the team has in you for you to take on this really big, really big presentation and also represent the team, the project and the stuff that you're working on. But also knowing that like nothing ever goes according. Yeah. To like we can plan. I think you and I are very similar. That way. Yeah. We plan a lot. Um, prepare, over prepare, what have you. It's just nothing goes according to plan. Do you think there's something around improvisation? I like, what can we do to think more on our f- I mean, this is something I've always struggled with. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm definitely the kind of person who, you know, if I'm going to be presenting, I will go and, you know, write down what I want to say, practice it, like have a script. And so I think that's something that I need to get better at. And I know, I mean, I, I think you took an improv class, right? Mm-hmm. Like technically improv classes should help us with this. Mm-hmm. And so I have not personally gone to take an improv class. Should we class. find one? <laughs> Maybe we should. I would think it's fun, but I yeah. do think there's a lot... Like, even in a lot of my GSB classes, there's cold calls. Mm. And I can totally tell. Like, I'm not someone who does well with cold calls. I'm trying to be better at that. Yeah. Yeah. Same. And I think it's almost like, for me, sometimes when I don't prepare as much, I do better. Because, like, my my brain and mindset are almost in, like, a more fluid kind of, like, in, you know. Oh, shoot. I feel like, is that a learning? (laughs) Maybe it is. Maybe it is. I, I think it might be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in 10 years, career-wise, and also personally, if there's things you can share there? This question always stumps me because I don't even know what I'm doing in the next year. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I, do, I do think 10 years out, professionally, I will probably still be in product. You know, hopefully I am some senior product leader somewhere. And personally... Uh, I am married, and so we are hopefully at that point in 10 years, I will have kids. Aww. And hopefully I will have figured out how to be a working mom and how to continue to grow in my career and not, you know, face a lot of the challenges that I know moms in tech face. Totally. Do you think product management is all that it's made out to be? Because I think the hot thing five, 10 years ago was I banking, consulting, perhaps over the last three years, the hot thing is to work in product. People want to transfer to product management. People want to get PM jobs right out of school. I would say it depends on the company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think at, at LinkedIn, where it is very product driven, um, I do feel like being a product manager is very rewarding. At other companies, it might be more eng driven or it might be more design driven. And so the PM role is, is really different mm. depending on where you are. Since you are now a senior product manager and you've gone through many interviews, um, interviewing people to join LinkedIn and potentially your team, how can aspiring PMs stand out in the interview? First of all, context for those who are interviewing. We realize that, you know, your interviewer probably was in back-to-back meetings right before the interview, the 30-minute interview. And so their mind is likely elsewhere when they first come into that interview. How people stand out is the first two minutes when I'm asking like, hey, can you introduce yourself? And they are able to draw me in like in 30 seconds and immediately I'm like right there like listening to them and like I'm compelled by what they have to say. And so I know it's so cliche, but practicing that your personal pitch and having that ready to go just makes you stand out because your interviewer will be you know, more engaged right from the beginning and they will know that you've prepared and are ready mm-hmm. and care about this job. Yeah. So. Having your elevator pitch down. Yes. Yeah. Something we learned um, in class is that it's the beginning and the end mm-hmm. that people remember, whether it's a presentation, an interview, People remember the beginning and people remember the end. The middle is a little bit fuzzy. (laughs) So I think if you can nail the start and potentially nail the end, that's a good way to set up for success. Yeah. One of my favorite questions to ask is at the end is like, hey, what are two things I should remember about you? 
That is also something you should prepare for. Um, I've never been asked that. It's it's useful for me when I'm writing up interview notes afterwards. So. True. I didn't realize until I started interviewing people was how interviews are processed and analyzed because there's a lot of work that interviewers have to do after the interview. Uh We have to do write-ups. We have to talk about what we talked about in the interview. And then we also have to compare with other interviewers as well Uh so that we can see holistically how the person performed. Because those are things like I didn't even realize until I started interviewing people. I had no idea. (laughs) That there's like an interview committee, kind of like a scoring, although I know we only have context from LinkedIn. Yeah. Emily, what is something that you've learned about yourself over the last few years? Um, so recently at work, I have felt a little more jaded than usual. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because I feel like when we work together, I feel like we're kind of cynical. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just who I am. But yeah. I've been at LinkedIn for five years, so I was doing a bit of reflecting. and That's like a lifetime in tech. Yeah. In is. tech terms. Yeah. And so, uh, and I, I noticed that I wasn't feeling as excited about work as I used to. And uh, something I... I learned about myself and in, in, in reflecting was that uh, I really value creative freedom. And I think that's something I have been missing. How are you fulfilling that creative freedom, either at work or in your personal life? I really want to start writing more because that's something that I used to enjoy, but haven't really carved out time for. Mm-hmm. And so I do want to be more explicit and more deliberate in how I spend my weekends or like maybe once a week, you know, just spending some time to, to journal and write and and have that creative freedom. Mm-hmm. It started because my my grandpa passed away a few months ago. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. And so, because I, I don't know how much I knew about him. I was trying to process the grief and just wanted to make sure there were things I could remember him by. And so one of the things that I started thinking about was like, I should write about how we, you know, used to play Mahjong every Sunday and like, see if there's a way I could just document it and, and like, remember him by. So... That was sort of the the impetus for mm-hmm. wanting to write more. Oh, that's so powerful. Yeah. And having those stories, I think, I mean, thinking through those stories and then having them with you for the yeah. rest of your life and sharing them with your family and stuff, yeah. I'm sure that would mean a lot. Yeah. This next segment, it's called Hot or Not. And here, hot means favorable, trending, not means outdated, less used. And we're going to talk about corporate tech jargon. The first one is synergy. It's not. How do you use this term? It came up once in a meeting. I forgot what I said. I think I said something like, we need to find synergy between these two projects. And it, it is a not for me. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if you do it with the hand motion. So, yes. Not okay. Double click. Let's double click on that. Have you said this? Oh, man. I, I definitely have said this. I mean, yeah, why not? Hot. Yeah. Let's not boil the ocean. It's one of my favorite things to say. Hot. Yeah. Mm. Especially to designers. When they try to redesign the entire product. Mm. And we don't have the resourcing to build that. Inflection point. We're at an inflection point. Not. You can say it if you're the CEO. (laughs) You give permission. Yeah. I feel like at every corporate presentation, maybe like all hands, like we're at an inflection point. I was just like, there's no way that at every single all hands we're at an inflection point. Yeah. So I think it is overused. Um, Low-hanging fruit. One of my favorite things. Hot. Yes. Let's take this offline. Hot. Let's touch base. Yeah. Hot. Move the needle. I hate that term. You hate it? Yeah. Why? I mean, I don't know. Like Needle movers. Project's going to move the needle. What needle are you removing? Like, where, where's this needle? Where, where, is it? It? Yeah. where is this needle? Where is it going? Yeah. Where is it starting? I don't know. That's fair. Yeah. The last one is bandwidth. I really have personal issues with the word. Cam's never, we don't uh, calculate our bandwidth. Oh, unlim- we have unlimited bandwidth? Exactly. That's dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Very dangerous That's for PMs. No, not. not. Okay. The last segment for us is corporate email sign offs. Are these sign offs that you would use? So first question for you is, how do you usually sign off your emails? Best. Best, comma, Emily. Emily. Yes. Okay. Yours faithfully. I don't think I've ever seen anyone use that 
as their sign off. Sincerely. Yeah, if you're writing a letter. <laughs> cheers. Yeah, cheers. Have you used it? I have. Mm. Yeah. Not that often, but cheers. <laughs> yes. Looking forward to your reply. That's just a little passive aggressive. <laughs> I've like, seen it though. You have? Yeah, for sure. Sending virtual hugs. <laughs> who, said, who says that? It's a no for you. Yeah. Thanks in advance. Yeah. I, I see people say like TIA. Really? Yeah. Thanks in advance? Wow. I didn't know that was a thing. Hmm. Slaying. No. <laughs> is that a Gen Z term? Yes, it is. No. The last one, would you just sign off with an E? I have a lot of thoughts about this. <laughs> you know, this is so random, but I, I do think it's kind of cool to be able to sign off with your initials and for it to sound nice. You know, like, what do you mean? well, as in like, I think for me, my initials are ET, so not really. Like, it's not something I'd want to put out there. I think it's cool. <laughs> okay. I tried calling you ET at one point. You were not about yeah. it. Okay, cool. That's all the questions I have. Um, what are two things you'd like me to remember? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this episode of Cherie's Corner. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe for more content like this. I read through the comments. I am super open to feedback. As you know, Cherie's Corner is a new podcast. So I'm just trying to be like, what do people want to see? I want to put good stuff out there and I want to be helpful. So let me know. One of my favorite parts of the conversation was when Emily told the story of her presenting to executives and the CEO of LinkedIn. Honestly, I was sweating for her when I was listening to that story because I just remember being in similar situations when I worked at LinkedIn in the corporate world and it is not easy. It feels like a 10 minute presentation, but when you're presenting basically your project that you've been working on for months and years to people who have you know, the decision-making power to, you know, push it forward, to support it, or to ax it if it doesn't go well. That's like a, that's a pretty high pressure situation. And so I loved that she was able to tell that story, especially because I feel like in the corporate world, a lot of those moments are not really shared publicly or people don't really talk about it. So I'm glad she was able to shine a light on like, this is kind of what happens in um, the professional setting. You, you give presentations, you can prepare as much as you want. Expect the unexpected. Loved that she was able to tell that story and basically peel back the layers of corporate a little bit more of what life as a product manager is like. Another main takeaway from this conversation with Emily was her bias for action. In undergrad, she was able to get internships and experiences and not only like land them, but really have a moment of reflection at the end of each one of them to be like, what am I taking from this internship? What am I leaving in this internship? Because she was able to figure out through experimentations what she likes and what she doesn't like. And that reflection carries with her to other parts of her life. And I think it's just a really important quality for young people to have, to just have a bias for action, put yourself in situations and see what you can learn from those situations. And I loved her story of her back end internship, her front end engineering internship, and then her product management internship, because each one of those experiences taught her something new about herself, which she could then apply to the next experience, which is what basically life is all about and our career is all about because we're all still trying to figure it out. And you can only really, my belief is that you can only really figure it out through doing. So having a strong bias for action can only help you in this world in this journey of figuring out what we're doing here. And finally, I think one huge takeaway from this conversation is that interviewing is complicated. Emily is a senior product manager at LinkedIn and she interviews people to be on her team and to join her company. So we've had an inside look on basically what happens behind the scenes as an interviewer. And she talks about really tactical ways that you can make your interview memorable because the people who are interviewing you are people too. There is a whole entire process behind it. At the end of the day, if you want the job, you have to stand out. So I think her tips on having your elevator pitch down, it's cliche, it works, 
have your elevator pitch down, be able to deliver it succinctly in like 45 seconds or less. So now you know that one of her main questions at the end of an interview is what do you want me to take away from this interview about you? And so you should always have those prepared. Like what do you want this interviewer to remember about you? And if you can be selective of what those two facts are, maybe three facts over prepare, then you can really, you know, go the extra mile and stand out. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Cherie's Corner and see you soon.